this first line that I wrote, I don't know if you're going to use it, but I thought it seems like a sort of joke that you would make. Uh, I, I can use that. No, you don't have to if you've got okay. a better one. If you've got a better one. I don't have a better one. It's just, you know, yeah, maybe I'll use yours. Yeah. Calm down. Thank you. You don't know how much this means to me. Thank you. Well, now you're, now you're making me not want to use it. Okay, I'll be quiet. Are you going to do Russian accents for the people? Um, not consistently. Okay. Why? For some reason I was planning on giving everyone like a New York accent. I don't care for that at all. Oh, okay. Welcome to Save Me From My Shelf, a literature podcast where we take classic tomes off their pedestal to make you less anxious about reading them. Our jokes come from a place of love and for a specific teaching purpose. However, if you think that making fun of great literature, and maybe some mild swearing, is offensive, this might not be the podcast for you. Hello, you are listening to Save Me From My Shelf. Voxel Station over here is Daniel. Grand Central. Is Abby, the New York one. The voxel thing will become funnier when we reveal what our text is today. There's a connection. Uh, because yeah, I, I, I yeah, think I know, know why. Yeah. You know uh, what I'm yeah. talking That's about. That's cool, isn't it? That? Yeah. yeah. And welcome to season three, everybody. So we have another ten episodes lined up for you, um, one every two weeks. So we're just glad to have you fine folks with us. As a bit of a reminder, we do take requests for text to cover, so please write into our email or submit a form on our website if there's a particular book or play that you would like us to recap. Do we have any letters or recommendations today? We had one letter. I won't read it all. It was, a, it was another in our series of uh, contributions to the Shakespeare authorship controversy. This person writes in, Do you know the one where his plays serve a flat earth group to point out that nothing exists outside of England? So he was the author, but he's working as some sort of shadow propagandist for yeah, this kind flat of flat earthers slash world beyond England denialism. That's a um, real thing, you know. Is it right? Yeah. Okay. It's like an extreme form of flat earthers where they're like nothing exists outside of the greater London area or something like that. Uh, well, I'm sure London is to a man think that but <laughs> anyway he gets a lot of map stuff wrong because he didn't believe in the outside world i don't believe it either that he was part of an evil anti-science group or that there's no world outside of the uk i've been to leal uh sticky outy tongue emoji <laughs> so um yeah i think i had heard something similar about how shakespeare doesn't have a great grasp on geography so i think he makes references to some things in terms of maps being wrong. He, he talks the coast about of Bohemia. the coast of Bohemia, and Bohemia does not have a coastline. So, interesting theory. Please write in if you have any other Shakespeare authorship conspiracy theories. I love them. I've just got one. That you made up or that you actually know? Made up. Okay. That he, it's like a sort of Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court situation, he was from like hundreds of years in the future when global warmings happened, and he's like warning us, because when he was alive, Bohemia... Like, when he was born, Bohemia did have a coast. Croatia and Austria had all been flooded okay. by rising sea levels. And yet, that's the best he could do. He couldn't be a little bit more explicit. He had to plant these little clues. You have the talent to travel through time and to become the best writer the world has ever seen. And you couldn't... Well, it's because Shakespeare's plays already existed. So he just went back and wrote them just ahead of those plays being written. And what added in... Yeah. These little nuggets. Yeah, yeah. Now, normally, this is the place where I ask Daniel what our text is today, but I actually have a little bit of a set the scene in terms of how we got to this text. So, what do we know about my esteemed co host? We know that Daniel has a PhD in 19th century literature. We know that his favorite color is green. We know he prides himself on having niche, bullshit, hipster tastes, but what he truly loves are The Simpsons, Abba, and Shrek. We know he prides himself on being a Cornishman, despite not actually being from Cornwall. And we know he's scared of butterflies. But what our audience probably knows best of all is that Daniel likes to make hasty decisions about what big, boring book we absolutely must cover every season, and then he comes to regret that decision at his leisure. So with that in mind, Daniel, what is our text today, friend? We're going back to the 19th century, to the 1860s. Steamboats threshing machines, capitalism, liberalism, modernity is here, and it's in full swing, you better believe it's in full swing, except Holy Russia, the Third Rome, seat of the one true church, is holding such atheistical forces at bay. Deep in the interior, on the great estates, on the peasant communes, 
The sacred traditions still hold sway, but Russia has a weak point, an Achilles heel. Sitting on the banks of the Nieva lies Russia's Babylon, its window to the west, St. Petersburg, a hotbed of showy superficialities, French fashions, English commerce, German ideas, a hotbed of radicals and nihilists. Indeed, the Tsar himself, Alexander II, has fallen prey to the modern values of the Occidental capital and has sundered the sacred bond twixt lord and peasant by liberating the serfs. No, we don't like that on this podcast, do we? If even the emperor of all the Russias could be swayed, how will Russia's youth fare? Well, we're going to find out in today's book, uh, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, written in 1866. This is why my Vauxhall joke I thought was appropriate. Uh, apparently, Tsar Nicholas I visited Britain in the mid-19th century to study trains, and he thought Vauxhall was just the absolute sh**, and so he introduced the term as the generic Russian word for train station. So if any of you go into Russian-speaking countries, any old train station is called Vauxhall. I thought that yeah. was neat. So it goes without saying, we are about to spoil this text for you. The trigger warnings are axe murder, being forced into sex work, madness, extreme poverty, lots of mental health stuff, suicide, sexual assault, animal abuse, alcoholism, and just general immiseration and squalor. You know, Russia. Yeah, you've got to embrace suffering, though. That's what it's all about. Would you like to do some background, please? Fyodor Dostoevsky. I am not a Russian speaker or reader. I'm just going to make that head. What? Yeah, so expect plenty of mispronunciations. Alongside Tolstoy, Turgenev, Gogol, Gogol, he's one of the big 19th century Russian novelists. Yeah, Dostoevsky's works, they kind of explore existential, psychological, religious and social themes, and they're kind of situated all in this disordered world of mid-19th century Tsarist Russia, where it's sort of half modernizing and half trying to resist modernity. So it's a bit like Silas Marner, but written from the point of view of someone simultaneously experiencing a hangover, a manic episode and a beating from a Cossack, uh, <laughs> is what I wrote here, which I think is a fair enough summation of it. The other big thing about his novels is their polyphony, uh, which was mentioned by a, a, a critic called Mikhail Bakhtin. So the novels contain a lot of dialogue between characters with very different views and voices. And so, you know, there's this kind of a sense of a, a conflict between equal intellects and uh, it kind of adds to this sort of psychological and feverish tone in the novels. Dostoevsky had quite an eventful life. He was born to a sort of like, you know, middle-class gentry family. That was kind of the same thing back then in Russia. He went to engineering school, but he was interested in novel writing and liberal politics. So he wrote a book in his kind of 20s, Poor Folk, which came in 1845, and that made a splash. But it was his youthful radicalism that really got him noticed by the Tsarist secret police. <laughs> well, joke there. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you still got it, Daniel, even Thank though you. we had our summer break. Yeah. In 1849, Dostoevsky and his like sort of mildly radical political circle were arrested and sentenced to death by firing squad. At literally the last minute, Dostoevsky and the rest were pardoned. They were all up there, going to get shot. They were against the wall. Had the last cigarette. Just then, a letter from the Tsar came, pardoning them all, or commuting them all, I should say. They all went to Siberia instead. So when Dostoevsky got out five years later, he was a changed man. He was no longer a kind of youthful liberal. He was a sort of weird, malcontent, spiritualist, reactionary crank. Sus Why? What about Siberia would do that to a person? <laughs> he became very uh, suspicious and cynical about modern values and institutions like liberalism, democracy, capitalism, enlightenment, reason. He also had epilepsy. I did not know that. So, yeah. He had a lot of uh, problems, and he had a gambling addiction. He had, he had some hobbies. Uh, Russian literature, then, this is our first foray into that, and there's a few issues, aren't there? Yeah, we thought we'd actually give the advice section a little bit up front here, because this is one of the reasons why people struggle a lot with Russian literature, is the naming conventions. And I think there's a way I can actually simplify this a little bit for you. So, first of all, in Russian lit, people tend to have three names. So it's your first name, the name of your... the patronymic, so it's the name of your dad, followed by Vich if you're a boy, or Ovna if you're a girl, and then your last name. So everyone's middle name is basically just what their dad's name is. So our protagonist of Crime and Punishment is called Rodion Romanovich, i.e. the son of Roman Raskolnikov. The other issue, and I think this is what people struggle with a lot this more. This is really confusing, yeah. And, uh, no, I don't think it is if you get, get in the right mindset. Oh yeah, yeah, once you get used to it. The thing that people dislike is that they love using nicknames, diminutive versions, but we do this all the time in English. So I think if you just remember that, and that might make it a little bit less fraught. So think about the name Elizabeth. She could be called Eliza, Eliza, Beth, Betty, Bessie, Bess, Betsy, Liz, Izzy, Libby, and Birdie. Those are all like commonly known 
yeah. diminutives for Elizabeth. The the advice is just remember that we do this all the time in English speaking countries, or indeed in most other countries, I think. And it might be helpful just to jot down nicknames as they come up. And you can sort of once you start writing them, you're like, oh, I bet it's that guy. That kind of looks like a shortened version of mm. that guy's name. Or if there's like a family tree or something, you might be able to just glance back and go, oh, it's probably this person. Yeah, that's referencing. helpful when they have the family yeah. trees. The other big thing is um, that the names in this all have kind of like Dickensian type second meanings, don't they? Mm. Like Raskolnik means a schismatic. So that kind of tells us something about his character that mm. you might not always follow the rules. Meanwhile, uh, Raskolnikov's friend, Dmitry Prokovich Razumikin. Razum means sense or reason. So I think he might be a bit more on the straight and narrow than his pal Raskolnikov. Can I just say that that's shit and tacky and I hate it? Oh, it's stupid, yeah. It's worse than Dickens as well, because at least with Dickens, they kind of like intangibly refer to... Well, like... Pumblechuk. There's no word in English that's like Pumblechuk, but you kind of have a sense it of what evokes. he's like. Whereas Dostoevsky's just like, uh, smelly of, because he <laughs> smells. Uh, <laughs> so, minus points for Dostoevsky there. All right. I hope you're, you're ready, because this might be a long session. So I'm going to need you to have a protein bar and go feed the meter and tell the boys you're not making bowling practice tonight. All right, Daniel, are you ready to feel the silence of God? St. Petersburg, summer. It's hot, it's dirty, it's impoverished. A bit like our protagonist, the good-looking university dropout Raskolnikov, who we meet sneaking out of his tiny one-room flat trying to avoid his rent-seeking landlady. He owes her a ton of money for living in this shitty tiny room. It's unrelatable today, I know. And he's also kind of a man on the edge. He seems <laughs> to be having kind of a nervous breakdown from page one, especially because he, he worries that his hat looks stupid. Quote, it was a tall cylindrical Zimmerman hat, all but worn out, quite faded, all holes and stains, brimless and dented so that it stuck out at an ugly angle. Yet it was not shame, but quite a different feeling, even more like fear that seized him. Okay, we're starting strong. He is wearing a hat I can only describe as brave. Mm -hmm. uh, he's out doing some crazy walking, and he's already in the throes of a mental health episode. If we are starting from this point, where can the book possibly go? Because it is a shit show at the fuck factory, friend. <laughs> First fuck factory in Russia, right? <laughs> Modernity is here at last. <laughs> He's on his way to the house of a pawnbroker, Alonya Ivanovna, who shares a flat with her sister, Lizaveta, who's this sort of kindly, simple-minded woman who Alonya treats like a slave. And the pawnbroker, Alonya Ivanovna, is almost a cartoon villain. She's this disgusting old woman with, they talk about her greasy hair and her neck like a chicken's leg, which is <laughs> really evocative. What is your leg? <laughs> like a chicken's neck. Yeah. Yes. Raskolnikov is let into her room to do some business, and he instantly starts taking stock of the room like he's Jason fucking Bourne. He's pawned some stuff with her before, and he's there today to pawn a pocket watch, which she barely gives him anything for but that's not the real purpose of his visit. He needs to see where she carries her keys and where she likely keeps all of her money. So it seems like a robbery plan is afoot. And he starts to feel really guilty and anxious as soon as he leaves, but sort of feels like, well, I can't turn back now. This is, this is inevitable. So this guy is just basically a walking entry of the DSM-5. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would have a nervous breakdown trying to sort his junk mail and just would end up panicking and eating all the flyers. So I personally can't wait to get a second-hand anxiety attack after 600 pages of this. It does have that effect on mm -hmm. one, doesn't it? In its early stages, the novel that became Crime and Punishment was going to be about alcoholism. Hmm. But then Dostoevsky went in a different direction, as we're going to see. So that's disappointing for all of us fans of the source. Um, no, it's not. You're not going to be disappointed. So after pawning his watch, Raskolnikov heads into the nearest bar to spend the proceeds. There he ends up chatting with a decayed old bureaucrat called Marmaladov, <laughs> who, as his name suggests, is in a bit of a jam. Daniel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it means jam, doesn't it, Marmalade? Uh, <laughs> Marmalade. He tells Raskolnikov that he and his family are living in dire poverty, and yet he can't stop drinking. So... He kind of lists off this, there's a kind of litany of horrible things, aren't there? He pawns everything, even his wife's stockings. He has no idea how his children are getting fed, but he can't stop drinking. He's a compulsive drinker. -y. Yeah, but he's also like weirdly jovial. Yeah, he's he, a funny character. He decides that Raskolnikov is his best friend in the world, and it's all very Mozart asking Salieri for piggyback rides energy. That's the sort of mentally kind of who I cast. Yeah. But I think we've all been in a pub where somebody has decided we are their best friends. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So... 
Marmaladov's wife is a consumptive ex-noble, and she cajoled Sonia, Marmaladov's daughter from a previous marriage, into becoming a sex worker to keep the family from going under. And Sonia's like, you know, do, do I have to become a sex worker, as you often say to your mum? And the, her stepmother's like, what's there to save? Some treasure, so... Hey, big old bag of bitch. Jesus, you do it! <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, yeah. So, after Sonia's first night out, her stepmother knelt at her feet, kissing them, so... Ew, you don't, don't know what dirty men's lips have been there? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of foot fetishists in Petersburg, aren't there? <laughs> so, despite all of this misery, Marmaladov's quite a funny guy. The book in general has a, its funny moments, doesn't it? I think it's kind of so excessively ridiculous that it kind of becomes quite funny. And everyone in the bar finds Marmaladov hilarious and likes to hurl abuse at him. Raskolnikov also has a kind of mor morbid fascination with the guy. Yeah, he's like, I dropped out of school, I'm contemplating a felony, I can't even face my hat anymore, but <laughs> goddamn if this guy doesn't put things into perspective. Yeah, it's nice to have someone like that around you, isn't it? <laughs> so, the next day, Raskolnikov wakes up with a hangover and finds out his landlady is going to call the cops on him if he doesn't pay his rent. He is the missing cast member from Rent. This is what the show needed, not all those other assholes making bad art and doing heroin. <laughs> anyway, Raskolnikov mostly spends his his days lying on the sofa that he uses as a bed and relying on Natasha, the landlady's servant, to bring him leftovers and tea. That's, you know, he's sort of, it's a freegan situation, but without all the effort of dumpster diving, he basically lives on scraps. Then Raskolnikov gets a letter from his mother, and he starts a shaking and a shivering with excitement like a chihuahua about to pee everywhere. That Russian dog, Borzoi. Borzoi, I don't you say it. I was thinking, come on, no chihuahuas here, please. I like that every chihuahua is 87 years old with a thousand medical ailments, but death cannot touch them. Yeah, they, they have the Three Stooges thing where all the illnesses are trying to get through the door at once. <laughs> I like that. That's in The Simpsons. Oh. <laughs> like all of my jokes. Oh. So his mother is very poor, but she tries to help him with money whenever she can. Uh, but she's obviously really disappointed that he's quit university for seemingly no reason. I cannot believe this guy made it through one semester. What fucking university did he go to? Fugue State? <laughs> then Raskolnikov learns that his sister Dunya has been going through some stuff. So she's just moved back in with their mother after a terrible stint where she was a servant in this house of this family named Svidrigailov. Now, Mr. Svidrigailov kept sexually harassing Dunya, and the wife thinks that it's all Dunya's fault that she is the seductress and she kicks Dunya out and the whole town turns against poor Dunya. Yeah. Yeah, but thankfully, the wife eventually finds out, you know, Mrs. Svidrigailov finds out that it was actually her husband sexually harassing the servant all along. She begs for Dunya's forgiveness in front of the whole village, and it's all it's all actually turned out okay. Dunya has even managed to get engaged to a guy with a decent job in St. Petersburg. He's a fairly well-to-do 40-something lawyer named Pyotr Petrovich Luzin. And let's remember, Luzia means puddle. Very cool. Yes, yeah, yeah. so he's a bit of a... Bit Drip. Of a yeah, <laughs> wet blanket. Yeah. Quote, there is no special love either on her side or on his, but Dunya, besides being an intelligent girl, is at the same time a noble being, like an angel, and will regard it as her duty to ensure the happiness of her husband. Wow, what a Cinderella story. <laughs> so, turns out Mama and Dunya are moving to St. Petersburg to be with Dunya's new fiancé, and maybe the fiancé will even be able to give Raskolnikov a job. So, you know, it's all, it's all looking... Good, right? All good news for Rakolnikov, right? Wrong. Because our Ugh. buddy gets profoundly butthurt that Dunya's fiancé didn't ask for his blessing first, and he also thinks that Dunya is sacrificing herself uh, in marriage. So he's like, I gotta sabotage this engagement. He analogizes Dunya's decision to marry Luzhin with Sonya's going on the game. Yeah, Doesn't ooh, she? marriage is prostitution. Okay, gl calm down, Gloria Steinem. Can you mind your own business? <laughs> yeah. Can uh, you do that for me, nosy? So, Raskolnikov heads out, despite mostly being a kind of recluse. So, let it be known, dear listener, that whenever Raskolnikov goes anywhere in St. Petersburg, he, he kind of runs into all these kind of horrible set pieces. People throwing themselves into canals, all kinds of mad stuff like that. But yeah, we haven't got time to cover all of them. Oh God, no. <laughs> The book's riddled with these kind of melodramatic, crazy moments. Why is he out now? Well, Raskolnikov, he has one friend, Razumikin, whom he has avoided for months. But the letter from his mum has prompted him to see if his friend can get him any work. While walking to Razumikin's apartment, he remembers that he has a plan to do that. We don't know what To do what? That, in, uh, in italics. We don't know what that is yet, 
but he changes his mind. Instead, he goes and has a vodka and passes out in the bushes. I mean, who among us? Yeah, has- uh, <laughs> Raskolnikov, uh, he has one of his classic morbid dreams. Spends a lot of time asleep in this book or unconscious. Yeah, he- I think we're going to put in a ding every time he collapses in some sort of nervous fit. He is a child. He's out walking with his dad. They see an old horse struggling to pull a cart down the main street. And the peasant driving it is whipping the animal to excess. Other people start joining in, drunkenly whipping the animal and laughing. And young Raskolnikov is horrified, but his dad's like, well, whatever, don't pay it any mind. The horse is beaten to death in front of everyone, and Raskolnikov breaks free from his dad and runs to it, crying and kissing it. Oh, don't so. worry, buddy. Naturalism scares me, too. Oh, <laughs> would you call this naturalism? I think the way in which they describe the horse is certainly gearing up towards it, if not there already. But then it's also, like, ultra-symbolic, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's it crazy. What do you think... What's this bit about? Well, I think, first of all, the fact that what the horse means is deliberately muddied. So, is the horse... Raskolnikov himself, is it the pawnbroker woman, or is it his sister? Yeah. They're all just trying to carry on in their own nature, and the world is sort of tearing them apart for it. Secondly, I think, uh, just because this is a book that's so preoccupied with death and what does life mean, and I think this is a way for him to process death, sort of in light of his plans to do that, Mm -hmm. quote-unquote. So the moral of the book is basically, death is coming for all of us, so you're going to be fine, and then you're going to die. Russia. This doesn't even qualify as a nightmare in Russia. On his way home, Raskolnikov goes through a market and he sees the sister, the the poor dumb sister of that ugly old pawnbroker. And he overhears that the sister, Lizaveta, she's going to be away from home tomorrow evening, leaving the pawnbroker there all by herself. Raskolnikov thinks back to when he first met the pawnbroker and when he had overheard some students talking about her. Quote, you have a stupid, meaningless, worthless, wicked, sick old crone, no good to anyone, and, on the contrary, harmful to everyone, who doesn't know herself why she's alive. Kill her and take her money, so that afterward, with its help, you can devote yourself to the service of all mankind. Wouldn't thousands of good deeds make up for one tiny little crime? For one life, thousands of lives saved from decay and corruption. It's simple arithmetic. This is like if Microsoft Excel invented a terrorist. So Raskolnikov starts his preparations, and he begins by sewing a loop of some sort inside his coat for hanging an axe inside so no one will see him carrying it. Just concealed carry much? This American psycho motherfucker. And he also wraps up a piece of wood in some paper to stand in as, you know, some new thing that he wants to pawn with the woman. So she'll be distracted while trying to unwrap it. So he's just up to all kinds of deviltry today. He really ties it up, doesn't he? Yeah, he really secures it. Package, tied it with string. It's one of my favorite things. So then Raskolnikov gets on his detective fiction bullshit and thinks that the reason why so many crimes are detected is because the criminal lacks the will and calm rationality to get away with it. In short, they all panic, but not him. He's going to be a real cool customer. <laughs> you know, this this guy, famous for his chill, as yeah. we've already seen. And now we head off into the big scene of the novel. Uh, he heads out, quote, sedately without hurrying, so as not to arouse any suspicions. He keeps seeing clock faces and hearing chimes everywhere, doesn't he? That's like, it's good. Time is, time is what he's indicating there, Dostoevsky. Um, yeah, Dostoevsky, please floor it and drive us all straight into this metaphor at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, so he realises he's running out of time. He's pleased to see a big hay bale wagon thing in front of the pawnbroker's building. That will, like, obscure his entry, so lots of, you know... Dumb luck is happening here. He heads up into the apartment building and knocks on her door. The door opens by a tiny crack. Two sharp, mistrustful eyes stared at him from the darkness. He barges in and presents his pledge to Alyona. But why are you so pale? Look, your hands, they're trembling. Did you go for a swim, dearie, or what? She asks him. Fever, he responds. Now look at this thing I brought you. So Alyona, she struggles to open the parcel. And she's like, oh, you know, excuse me for one moment while I, while I turn my back. <laughs> uh, Maraskolnikov musters his meager strength and brains her with the blunt end of the axe a few times. Why the blunt end? Now is not the time to be coy, my good bitch. <laughs> well, you just go straight for it. 
If I'm there to murder somebody, yes, I'm not going to be cute about oh, it. Oh, no, stop. No, because you want a clean kill. I, you... It's a cleaner kill to chop her in the head, not whack her about it. Come what on. What do you think her head's full of? Oh, yeah, because braining her isn't going to release blood everywhere. Not as much, I don't think. You've got to be kidding me. Right, well, peep, I think listeners should write in. What do you think? What would you do? What would you do in this position? Anyway, so... what's the, Yeah, what's literally your next sentence? Blood everywhere. Yeah, imagine how much more there would be. That's oh, all I'm saying. Oh, shush, <laughs> He roots around her body to find her keys and then ransacks the flat, finding a few of her pawn goods and stuffing them into his pocket. I really love the way this scene is written because I think it's very easy, especially with sort of violence against women, to really um, get kind of prurient and sordid with it and really exploitative. Mm. And I think Dostoevsky treads a very fine line between accurately portraying the gruesomeness of what he's done. Like, he doesn't shy away from, this is awful, but he also shies away from sort of ogling the body and sort of, you know, well, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, it's almost worse for being so matter of fact mm. and clinical when discussing yeah. the gruesomeness. Um, and I, th I think that was really the right call. Also, can I just query your Russian accent? You're getting a little Dracula. It's a little, it's a little east of Vienna. Quote, Suddenly, there was the sound of footsteps in the room where the old woman lay. Raskolnikov heads into the main room to see poor old Lizaveta, the pawnbroker's simple, poor, abused sister, quote, frozen, staring at her murdered sister, white as a sheet, as if unable to utter a cry. And then Raskolnikov rushes at her with the axe raised. Quote, this wretched Lizaveta was so simple, so downtrodden, and so permanently frightened that she did not even raise a hand to protect her face. Oh, so, yeah, he kills her, and it's horrible. It's maybe even worse than the first murder because she's so pathetic and the murder is so unnecessary. It's just, like, bad timing. And he does it the way you would want him to do it. it yeah, exactly. He slices her in twain. Yeah, yes, yeah, completely in half. Yep. Um... <laughs> Now, so then he, he cleans himself in the axe up, so we get a little axe bath scene. And then he realizes, uh-oh, the door's been open this whole time. Did somebody see? No, no one's watching. God is silent. And so he makes his escape. There's a bit of a cat and mouse thing as he tries to get down the stairs before anyone else in the busy building comes up and sees him. Oh, come on. You've got to mention those guys knocking at the door trying Why? to pawn their stuff. Because it's a great bit. They're knocking at the door. He's put it on the latch. But he hasn't locked it, and so they're like, well, they must be in. Come on, open up, I've got stuff to pawn. And he's like, uh, 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 uh. that's such a terrifying bit. Okay, all right, all right. I was just trying to keep this moving. Yeah, well, I've done it now, so okay. pressing on. <laughs> he gets away from there. He anyways. gets yeah. away anyway is the bottom line here. They go and get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and get the super. They, they do that, don't they? What, where are you from now? You're moving back. You're moving back west. So Petersburg is a very ethnically diverse city. <laughs> all right. Yeah, you want to go and get the super? Try and unlock the door. So they run down, Raskolnikov gets out. Do you know what my favorite thing in the world about you is? That God gave you a voice but not the capacity to feel shame. <laughs> so Raskolnikov arrives back at his flat, more dead than alive, he says, and he conks out. Oh, baby need a nap. That's the end of part one. That's a great bit, isn't it, that murder bit? I hope the the rest of the book manages to keep up this amazing pace. The tension here is wonderful. <laughs> Me too, yeah. This is such a thrilling book. Yes. Well, we've had the crime. Now, just a bit of punishment. Yeah. A, a bit of punishment? Because we still have five more parts to go. Oh, yeah. Well, if you can't do the crime... <laughs> you know, that's, I think that's the message of this book, isn't it? If, you, if, you, if you're going to read the first part, you've got to read the other five. Uh, <laughs> so, the next day, Raskolnikov... He's freaking out. Why? I don't, I don't know. I mean, he, he does that every day, doesn't he? So it's probably... <laughs> Nastasia turns up. She wakes him, telling him the police want to see him. Oh, no. She's it. It's the fuzz. Yeah, yeah. Raskolnikov, he heads to the police station. Cool, cool as a cuke again. If you say cuke one more time, I'm walking off this podcast. I hate that. This is a good set piece, isn't it, the police station? So the stairway to the station is all covered with swill. What What is that exactly? Is that... I don't know. I assume it's like from buckets to from mopping things. Although pigs eat swill, don't they? And the cops are pigs. So I suppose maybe... Oh, was I don't that... think Dostoevsky's doing that. Yeah. I wasn't sure if they meant like stuff from spittoons or if they yeah. were talking about puke or like what... I think it's the, all of the above. Uh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the place stinks of rancid oil and there are sort of peasants lolling around in the waiting room and pockmarked scriveners everywhere. This is like my dream, isn't it? I love pockmarked scriveners. <laughs> he meets the chief clerk, Zamyotov, and he's 
a classic clerk. I think he's probably in my top eight clerks. Daniel did his PhD on clerks, so just guys. I really love clerks, yeah. God. Finally, Reshkarnikov meets the lieutenant, lieutenant, I don't know how you want to say that. He's a volatile guy. They call him Lieutenant Gunpowder, don't they? And they start arguing. Are, are they going to nab him for the murder? No. What? Turns out Raskolnikov has been summoned because he owes money to his landlady. Oh, so this is just like a Judge Judy civil court deal. It's not... The very same. Wow. Yeah. So Raskolnikov, he considers confessing to the murder then. <laughs> Because uh, he's already like so, feels like he can't handle the pressure. But then he hears Zamyatov and another policeman discussing the murder. No one saw the murderer. So he's like, ooh, you know. Lucky piece of information. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to overhear that. Yeah, it's good that the cops are just so blase <laughs> important evidence. They don't realize the call is coming from inside the house. The friend. very same, yes. Raskarnik, I was like, well, might as well just, uh, you know, head out. <laughs> head out like I've done nothing wrong. He gets up and immediately faints in his classic way, will this arouse suspicion? What, having a visible, debilitating, psychosomatic reaction? Will that raise any red flags for the police, do you think? I don't know, I don't know what police methods are like. So he manages to get home, he knows that he's got to get rid of the jacked items that he stole from the pawnbroker, but where? Should he throw them in the river? No good. He has a total paranoid episode about people on boats looking at him. Mm -hmm. I was thinking actually that this book really covers the whole range of human emotion. We got disgust and sympathy, love, grief, anger, being scared shitless by canal barges, all of it. Instead, he ends up hiding all of his stolen pawn shop items under a huge rock in some random workshop yard. It's reminding me a little bit of Silas Marner, where he hides all of his gold under the, un yeah. in the ground. Like, yeah, I think it's quite a similar book in some Under respects. the loom, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hashtag men stop hiding important things in the ground, 1860s challenge. He finally pays a visit to Razumikin, his college buddy. And Razumikin thinks Raskolnikov is great. He's like, oh, buddy, it's so good to see you. Remember how I wrote Stay Cool in your yearbook? Mm -hmm. And Raskolnikov is like, yeah, I have some devastating news for you about that. So Razumikin is just this good-natured guy, and he suggests that the pair earn money together by translating foreign literature into Russian. So great, a way out of poverty and despair. Uh, that's exactly what Raskolnikov had been hoping earlier. But will he take the job? Well, Raskolnikov, sing it if you know the words, instead goes home and passes out in some kind <laughs> of nervous fit. So that's pretty much the end of that side hustle. Now, Razumikin, who isn't so much a friend as he is a fucking service animal, he manages to track down where Raskolnikov lives, and he nurses him back to health and even fetches him some slightly better clothes and brings a doctor named Zosimov who's interested in mental health, and he's just doing, like, everything you could do to help a person, right? While Raskolnikov is semi-unconscious, all the people tending to him, they're all gossiping about this horrible double murder in the neighborhood including that a house painter has been arrested under suspicion of the murder. Do you think Kafka read this? Because there's that whole Joseph K. house painter, the trial sort of thing. And oh, maybe they're alluding to that then. Yeah, you're so, obviously right. Aren't so you? I, yeah. I, I, I bet you're right. Yeah, this is a bit Kafkaesque, isn't it? Yeah, In its yeah own it way. is. So Kafka plus Dickens. So everyone calls Raskolnikov's flat a ship's cabin. And uh, I, this is not one for the young people. You know that bit in A Night at the Opera where they're in that tiny ship's cabin and people just keep coming in? This is a bit like that, isn't it? There's nothing funnier than loads of people trying to fit in a small room, I think. I don't know if that's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a clown car. It's like people are constantly coming and going like more than you could... <laughs> it is like a clown car, yeah. More than is reasonable. Yeah. Everybody, the moment you turn up in St. Petersburg, you're like, gotta go to the restaurant. <laughs> it's, it's like a tourist attraction type thing. Does somebody new come in? A peevish-looking gentleman. He's looking for Raskolnikov. His name is Piotr... Petrovich Luzhin. Yeah, it's Raskolnikov's brother-in-law to be. The priggish Luzhin is off-put by this squalid scene, but Razumikin explains that Raskolnikov's been ill. He's like, okay, I'll, you get a pass, yeah, but... Yeah, this time. Yeah. So Raskolnikov is arsy with Luzhin. So, for whatever reason, at this moment, all the boys start talking about politics. Luzhin is enthusiastic about modern liberal values. Science says love yourself before all, because everything in the world is based on self-interest. Oh good, I hope we hear a lot more from this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like a bit of Adam Smith for you all. <laughs> Razumikin rebukes him slightly before returning to murder chat. <laughs> so apparently the murderer didn't get the best part of the pawnbroker's loot. There what? was 
1,500 plus rubles in cash hidden in a strong box. Oh, Raskolnikov, you absolute fucking muppet. You cased the joint and that's the best you could. <laughs> Sorry. It just got like some like, you know, snow globes and things. It? Like, <laughs> it was like rubbish stuff. <laughs> Lujin blames social depravity for the murder. You know, he's like, yeah, I've heard about this too. Russia's going the wrong way. And Raskolnikov's like, well, surely this murderer, whoever he was... Not um, me, not me, Yeah, yeah I, 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 could, I couldn't imagine. ...was loving himself before all, all others, as you preach. So it turns into a big argument, and Raskolnikov has a go at Luzhin for wanting to dominate a poor family under the guise of saving it, i.e. his own family. They all kick off, and Luzhin storms out. So that's a good uh, first meeting with you. Mm -hmm. to be, isn't it? Yeah. Christmas with the family will be fun for all, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. 6th of January. <laughs> about the orthodoxy. <laughs> I'm all about the orthodoxy. So after all of this, Raskolnikov, who's been basically unconscious for days, he manages to sneak out without anyone seeing. And he goes to a cafe where he gets vodka drunk and searches through newspapers looking for info on the murder. This is sort of an analog push notifications. Um, and it's just his luck that one of the police officials is there, Zamyatov, one of the guys who saw him faint at the police station. And he's like, oh, hey, you, I recognize you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come sit with you. Now, Raskolnikov acts increasingly weird and suspicious. So they get talking hypothetically, of course, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, about how Raskolnikov would get away with a crime. You had listed this as the O.J. Simpson, if I did it. Yeah, sort it's of a lot thing. like that, isn't yeah, it? It's, yeah, it's very similar. And Raskolnikov tells him, hypothetically, you know, exactly what he did. Then we get to this really scary moment where Raskolnikov has kind of a breakdown, and he leans in close to the guy and starts moving his lips like he's talking, but no sound comes out, and he knows it's weird, but he can't stop doing it for a full <laughs> half minute. I'm just like, unmute! Hit the unmute button, you freak! Piss off with this Blanche Dubois compulsion! So then when he finally regains the power of speech, he, he properly loses it, and he's like, you, you think I murdered the woman, don't you? And the police guy's like, no, definitely not. Nothing terrifying here. And then Raskolnikov just, like, crab walks out of the cafe. It's possibly the weirdest scene in the book. It is a strange bit. Raskolnikov goes home to find an irate friend. It's all very wife in curlers. What sort of time do you call this? So Razumikin has been wondering where Raskolnikov got away to being so ill. And Raskolnikov's just a real jerk to his friend, saying that he never asked for mm. his help. Razumikin says, quote, You're made of spermaceti ointment with whey instead of blood in your veins. The first thing you do in any circumstance is try not to resemble a human being. Mm -hmm. Boom! Harsh words. Run him under the tap, because that's a burn. So their friendship is on the rocks. Um, try more vodka, maybe that will help. And then Raskolnikov leaves again. He goes back to the scene of the crime and is surprised that they've cleaned it up and they already have the decorators in. I, I'm not really sure how long he hoped they'd leave the bodies in gore, but um, Raskolnikov goes in, starts talking to the painters. He acts himself a proper creep, asking them all of these really gross questions about the murder. And the two painters are like, what the fuck? Get out of here with this. Later, Raskolnikov is wandering around all the squalor of St. Petersburg. Uh, when he sees a man get run down by a carriage. Ooh. It's Marmaladov, uh, the drunk he'd met previously. Oh no, he's been back out with the barflies, hanging out with Mickey Rourke. And now he's been turned to jam. Um, so Raskolnikov and some others carry the dying man up to his nearby flat where his wife, Katerina Ivanovna, and the children... Well, they're all horrified, aren't they? Because it's not nice. When you... Seeing your squashed dad. There's no hope for the man. Uh, he's been seriously crushed, and Katerina... Katerina Ivanovna and all the children pray at his bedside. It's very filmic, I like this bit, isn't it? Where all the kind of curious neighbours, quote, from all down the stairs crowded into the entryway, but without crossing the threshold. The whole scene was lighted by just one candle end. So, Sonia arrives. His daughter, if you remember from yeah. the first marriage, the one who has been forced into sex work. Well, she turns up in street fashion. Oh no. Which we all know what that means, don't we? A cheap gaudy dress, a parasol, and a feathery hat. Uh, She's got her pleather bustier and her <laughs> Julia Roberts boots from it, Pretty Woman. Exactly, yeah. And a feathery hat. Uh, <laughs> that's what the boys like. Yeah, and the narrator, this is, I, I don't particularly like this bit because the narrator in this horrible scene of like familial grief, make sure to point out that Sonia is a really pretty blonde. So we kind of get a hint of Raskolnikov's inner monologue here where he's basically thinking like, 
Hey, I really liked how your dad died. Do you want to get coffee? And I just think, oh good, adding a chick to the mix is really going to make him reasonable. So anyway, Raskolnikov, he's there, you know, still there. And he gives them some uh, money that had been sent to him by his mother, a full 25 rubles. He doesn't even know this family. That's like a huge amount of money that his mother had scrimped and saved for. Well, it's funny you should say that. Because I haven't been able to find the, root, <laughs> the root ball measuring worth. Don't get me excited for measuring <laughs> I worth. I did, I did try and work this out right. You measuring worth teased me. Yes, I did. I tried to do it. I, I saw what a ruble was worth in pounds today. Mm -hmm. And it was 0 0.01 pence. Okay. So, what's that? Well, the point was it didn't work anyway. But yeah. it's like, I think a ruble was like 40 quid or something in yeah. 19th century England. So, this is a lot of money. So... Raskolnikov gives him the money and he leaves, and he's filled with the new boundless sensation of a sudden influx of full and powerful life. There's always lines like that in Russian novels, aren't they? They always kind of go like, I've never felt this way before, I've never been so happy, I'm full of it, it's pouring in me. Yeah, As a non-Russian, I don't feel like that, ever. <laughs> What were you to say? No, that's that's very much part of the Russian yeah. condition. Yeah. Um, that I think is felt a lot in the literature, and it, people say it has to do with their extreme seasons, where they have these very short bursts of work in the spring and summer, mm -hmm. where you have to get things planted and the harvest in, and then the long grinding winter. So it's like mostly misery, but then these incredibly accelerated. Raskolnikov meets up with Razumikin, and the pair head back to his flat to find his mother and sister already there waiting for him. And he collapses into their waiting arms and falls unconscious again. I really hope Razumakin draws a dick on his face during one of these episodes. End of part two. So his mother and his sister are there, and Raskolnikov brings a real, like, dad from Twilight energy and tells his sister that she's got to break up with her fiancé. Uh, and so his friend Razumakin, who's also there, has gotten super drunk after all the hoo-ha with Raskolnikov running in and out. Razumakin manages eventually to get the sister, Dunya, alone, and he confesses in the sort of like 30 seconds he's seen her that he's already fallen in love with her. And there's a, there's a little bit of a queer reading here where Razumakin is like, quote, you know, you resemble your brother terribly much. Hey. I mean, Raskolnikov would have to be hot for Razumakin to put up with all this shit. <laughs> so Dunya's really embarrassed by it because Razumikin's sweet, but he is a bit of a crusty bitch. She's like, mm, you kind of look like a wet cigarette, and also I'm already marrying another dude for financial security, so sorry. <laughs> we then learn that Dunya is very attractive, and even their mother, who is a total hag of 43, has managed to retain a scrap of her former beauty, and Dostoevsky just makes a real fucking meal about how improbable it is that she's still attractive, despite how hideously old she is. So, so then Raskolnikov's mother and sister get a letter from Luzin, the sister's fiancé, saying, look, I want to see you guys later, but I do not want to see your shitty brother <laughs> anywhere around me going forward. And if he turns up to family functions, I will leave. I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt because he was supposedly ill when he insulted me, but then I heard that he was well enough to leave the house immediately after and help a drunk who got trampled, and what's more, he gave that drunk's daughter, a woman of ill repute, the entire 25 rubles that you guys just raised to help him. He gets really gossipy. He's like, oh, the, he gave it to her on the pretext of it being for a funeral. No, but he, he's yeah. just paying her for sex work. So poor old Dunya is given an ultimatum. Your brother or me? I'm sorry, but Dunya escaped her shitty employer Svidrigailov for this dude? Isn't that kind of a lateral move? Uh, yeah, well, definitely. Also, it's weird that Luzhin lives in the same building as the Marmaladovs. Well, there are only like eight flats in apparently, Saint Petersburg. Yeah, so, apparently. Yeah. The rest is all like churches and prisons. <laughs> we have to, yeah, and, and uh, government buildings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Clarks, baby. Dunya and Raskolnikov get into a big fight about her marrying Luzhin, the rich guy. And Raskolnikov is like, You mustn't debase yourself to support me. And she's like, I'm not doing this to support you. I'm doing it to support myself. You know, I'm an independent woman who is independently making herself dependent. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw some money your way, but I don't want to be poor. Raskolnikov faints again. Yeah. So. Hashtag Raskolnikov Stay Conscious Challenge 2022. Take it, it to Twitter, people. Make this trend. Sonia turns up at his flat. Marmaladov's uh, sex worker daughter. The one that Raskolnikov kind of 
creeped yeah. on a little bit on her dad's deathbed. Oh, death she's bed. so beautiful. <laughs> I like the way she grieves. Yeah. <laughs> so Sonia turns up. Everything's a bit awkward because of you know because of her reputation. Nevertheless, Raskolnikov welcomes her in, and uh, she passes on Katerina Ivanovna's you know so her stepmother's invitation to Marmaladov's funeral and wake. Raskolnikov's mom and sister leave the flat and express their worries about Raskolnikov. Why is he hanging around this woman with a quote notorious reputation? No, if if I were them, I would be relieved. If Raskolnikov told me that he had started seeing somebody, I'd be like, dating or hallucinations? They should be delighted that she's a real woman turned <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Let's have the Sonia description, because uh, uh, it's, it's very strange, and it continues to be strange throughout the book. She had a thin little face, and rather irregular, somehow sharp, with a sharp little nose and chin. She could not even have been called pretty, but her blue eyes were so clear, and when they were animated, the expression of her face became so kind and simple-hearted that one involuntarily felt drawn to her. There was, besides, a special char characteristic feature of her face and of her whole figure. Despite her 18 years, she looked almost like a little girl, much younger than her age, almost quite a child. And this sometimes even appeared comically in some of her movements. Raskolnikov then remembers that he actually did pawn some of his family heirlooms with the pawnbroker back in the day. Uh, which is kind of how he met her. And he's like, ooh, the police are going to find a record of that. They're going to link my name to hers. Um, so maybe I should go back and talk to the police again and maybe see if I can get my stuff back. And it's just, I'm like, leave it alone. Stop picking at the scab, sir. So his buddy Razumakin is actually distantly related to one of the inspectors. And so he's like, hey, let's go straight to the police officer's house <laughs> uh, so he drags his poor buddy there to his you know the cop relatives flat and things instantly start to go bad he he starts getting all paranoid thinking the cops know it was him what done it and the cops sort of reveal actually we we've been looking into you raskolnikov because months ago apparently raskolnikov published an essay called On Crime Whoa. in some sort of shitty journal. Is he going to write one called On Punishment? <laughs> so uh, Raskolnikov's article examines the psychology of criminals. He also thinks that there are some people who actually have a moral right to commit a crime and some people for whom law just doesn't apply. And he splits them into, quote, the ordinary and the extraordinary. I'm sorry, but this is an instant messenger away message from a troubled teenager in 2006. Mm -hmm. this, I'm getting creepy 4chan incel vibes from... There's a bit of that in there, ooh, yeah. Just his manifesto. So Raskolnikov is like, no, 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 you don't understand. Let me, let's engage. Let me clarify what I meant. I, I'm, I don't mean me. Um, he, he merely meant that an extraordinary man has the right to do something illegal for the sake of progress. And he uses the not at all unhinged logic that Isaac Newton would have been well within his rights to murder a hundred people if a hundred people stood in the way of his discoveries. So in astrology terms, I guess Raskolnikov is kind of a Marie Curie sun with a Joseph Mengele rising. Yeah. Poor Fury, the detective, Razumikin's uh, relative, asks Ras Raskolnikov to come for like a more formal chat at, his, at the police station tomorrow. Then Raskolnikov and Razumikin finally leave. Razumikin, is, he kind of starts to have inklings that maybe Raskolnikov is somehow connected to the crime. I think he, but he can't quite believe it, can he? Uh, they part ways and Raskolnikov heads home. The book gets a bit strange here, doesn't it? So someone there has been waiting for Raskolnikov, a tradesman who takes one look at him and walks off. Raskolnikov's like, ho ho, what's all this then? And kind of follows him. The man simply remarks, you are a murderer. And wanders off. Guys, who let David Lynch on set? This is it, it such... Is like that, yeah, you're right, yeah. So then he thinks about his family and thinks about what they'd say if they found out. And also he thinks about Lizaveta, the Aliona's sister, the hapless second victim. And then, you know, this is all during some kind of weird dream. He wakes up and sees a stranger sitting at his bedside, one Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov. Svidrigailov, his sister's old sexual yes, harasser? Yes, Svidrigailov, his sister's old sexual harasser, exactly the same, the very same. Okay, there's no way that he didn't draw a d on Raskolnikov's face. Okay, so we have a new character who is bursting onto the scene with a lot of energy. So Svidrigailov, a total stranger, has broken into Raskolnikov's bedroom, and he's like, hey, I'm in love with your sister. Do you want a wingman for me? And Raskolnikov's going, I'm oh, sorry, what? 
And Spitra K. Love's like, okay, yes, I pursued your sister, but I'm also a victim, a victim of love. <laughs> okay, my wife just died, and yes, it's rumored that I beat her, but that's not how she died. She died of a stroke because she had a bath and a bottle of wine, which is how strokes happen. Okay, and yes, maybe I bullied another servant to suicide, but who cares? Let's do this. Help a guy out. I want to run away with Dunya to America or Switzerland. You know, Daniel, those famous two options. <laughs> Just this guy, could you imagine him in an era with smartphones? Because he would send dick pics to himself. Now, if you think this is already unhinged, just wait, because what's he going to say next? You'll never be able to predict it. He then goes, hey, do you believe in ghosts? The ghost of my dead wife plays cards with me sometimes. Also, what if the afterlife is just an outhouse covered in spiders? Mm. And Raskolnikov is sitting there going, you're insane. Which is a little rich coming from him. But I f***ing love this guy. Finally, a hero emerges. <laughs> a hero of our time. <laughs> Just what an energy to bring to a book. This is this is a hell of an entrance. And then Svidrigailov says, actually, I don't love your sister, Danya. I'm actually already working with a matchmaker to find a new wife, a sexy, like, 15-year-old wife. But I'm going to give 10,000 rubles to Danya to break up with her fiancé because that guy sucks ass. And Raskolnikov is like, I'm not helping you with any of this. Consequences for misogynists. Try it out. Raskolnikov and Razumikin head to a, an arranged meeting with uh, his mum, with Dunya, and yeah, with Luzhin. Despite Luzhin having said that he didn't want Raskolnikov there. So, it's all a little bit awkward. And he ignores Raskolnikov, who also, you know, reciprocates the cold shoulder. It is announced that recently deceased Marfa Svidrigailov, wife to Arkady Svidrigailov, the psychotic kind of uh, interloper from the previous chapter, left 3,000 rubles to Dunya in her will as a kind of an apology, isn't it, I think? Sorry my husband harassed you out of your job. Yeah, Sorry exactly. I gossiped about you to the whole town. The very same. Yeah, his night damages. And Raskolnikov's like, I also have big news. By which he means, like, Svidrigailov is also going to give you an extra 10 grand to break up with this dial tone. The decent proposal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he's like, I'm not going to say it until this man point at Luzhin, is gone. So uh, Raskolnikov's mum, she's like, come on, let's smooth things over. Luzhin, he's not interested. And he's like, love for one's future life companion, a future husband, ought to exceed the love for one's brother. So he's, he's not having any of this. Is a, this is a contest and I have to win it. <laughs> Shit kicks off. Shit kicks the fan. Um, <laughs> they have a big row. You know, everyone's questioning everyone's morals. They all start having a go at him, and Lucian's like, well, you're only having a go at me now because you're rich. Because for a long time, for several years already, there's a quote, Lucian had been having delectable dreams of marriage, but he kept hoarding up money and waited. In deepest, deepest secret, he entertained rapturous thoughts of a well-behaved and poor girl. She must be poor. Very young, very pretty, well-born and educated. Very intimidated, who, who had experienced a great many misfortunes and was utterly cowed before him. A girl who would all her life regard him as her salvation, standing in awe of him, obeying him, wondering at him and him alone. So, Lujin... It comes out in this big fight that he's only after Dunya because she's so poor, she needs him and he can control her. And Dunya's like, you're a real prick, I've got money now, I don't need you, get out, I choose my brother over you. So, hooray, they all celebrate, question mark, the breakup? So it, tur it turns into actually an alright family party after that. But then, as per usual, Raskolnikov's mood shifts, and he's like, I need to take a break from you guys, I'm going through some stuff, I hate everyone and everything in the world right now, which is all sort of terribly Russian. So everyone gets upset by his dark mood, but Razumikin, he's able to comfort Dunya and her mother, and he becomes, quote, their son and brother. Oh, this poor guy got friend zoned. More than friend zoned, he got family zoned. <laughs> so Raskolnikov goes a wandering, as he is wont to do, and he decides to go to Sonya's place, even though he's only met her a couple of times. And he's like, I'm gonna go away and I might never see you again. And they're kind of into each other because they're both sinners and they talk about despair and God, and Sonya even reads to him from the Bible. It's just pretty hot. <sighs> Then Raskolnikov says, listen, if I ever see you again, 
I'm gonna tell you who committed those murders because I know somehow. Unfortunately, living next door to Sonia is Svidrigailov, the creepy guy, Dunya's ex-employer and ex-sexual harasser. And unbeknownst to poor Raskolnikov and Sonia, who are talking, Svidrigailov is eavesdropping next door. <laughs> well, I've got a little thing here, and this is, this is my theory. I'm going to read this long quote, the bit where Sonia reads Raskolnikov the Bible. And I want you to tell me what this sounds like. She was already trembling in a tr real, true fever. She was approaching the word about the greatest, the unheard of miracle, and a feeling of great triumph took hold of her. There was an iron ring to her voice. Joy and triumph sounded in it and strengthened it. The lines became confused on the page before her because her sight was dimmed, but she knew by heart what she was reading. She had lowered her voice, conveying ardently and passionately the doubt, reproach, and reviling of the blind, unbelieving Jews, who in another moment, as if thunderstruck, would fall down, weep, and believe. And he, he who is also blinded and believing, he too will now hear, he too will believe, yes, yes, right now, this minute. And she was trembling with joyful expectation. I mean, it's a religious ecstasy. It sounds like they both got their rocks off. Yeah, she's reading the, the raising of Lazarus to her clients. That's what's going on, I think. I, no, I don't think that at all. I think she's doing genuine grim sex work, and this is the one moment of actual connection and, we'll say, bliss yeah. that they're feeling. Okay, well, in any case, so, it's like a sex scene. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's it's completely a sex scene, but I think this is, you know, one of the few times that she's getting as much as she gives. Oh, okay. Raskolnikov goes to the police station to see Porphyry. The, so, the detective whose house he just showed up at. Yeah, yeah. so here's another dialogue. There's a lot of dialogues in this, aren't there? So he's like, I've been asked to come here. Can the small talk kindly either ask your questions or let me go right now? Porphyry, he plays good cop, doesn't he? Horror he's, show cop, please. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's like, come on, we're both intelligent men. Why can't we just have a normal chat? So, uh, I mean, Porphyry just does some real, like, cat and mouse psychological yes, yes. stuff with Raskolnikov. It's Who's just... freaking out. Raskolnikov cracks. Okay, you think I did it? Arrest me, but stop tormenting me. And Porphyry's like, oh, oh. <laughs> Raskolnikov, no, you misunderstand me. You must still be ill. I'm genuinely fond of you and sincerely wish you well. Oh, um, that's a queer reading. That's very Killing Eve. I think Porphyry... It's coded as... Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. There you go. Then uh, they hear movement behind the door into Porphyry's office and Raskolnikov confronts him. You've sent the men to arrest me. But no, something much stranger happens. Mikolka, the guy that was previously accused of the murder, bursts in and confesses to the crime. What? Yes. Uh, Raskolnikov is like, well, I'll be leaving. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Daniel, did the, did the MDMA just kick in for you too? Because I don't know what is happening in this book. He's so a, a rando just bursts in and confesses to the murder. Well, he'd been previously accused, hadn't he? But now he's confessing to it. Okay. <laughs> so Raskolnikov's like, well, I'll be off then. Looks like you've got your hands full. Uh, later that day, the tradesman, who had previously turned up and accused Raskolnikov of murder, arrives to apologize. He's like, yeah, I'd been Porphyry's star witness. i have been hiding in the office while you were there just then, behind a partition. But I also heard about Mikolka turning up, because I was there. So, sorry about that. You know, so it looks like things are pretty smooth for Raskolnikov. What is happening? I mean, okay, there are plots in novels, especially in murder mysteries or thrillers, that make the reader do a sort of 180 on what they sort of think is happening. Dostoevsky isn't doing a 180. He is doing donuts in the parking lot. <laughs> So, by this logic, if somebody confessed to it, did Raskolnikov not do the murder then that we saw? Is it all in his head? What is happening? Mm. This scene really... I, I read this scene about five times where I'm like, wait, what? The Porphyry Raskolnikov dialogue as well is very intense, yes. isn't it? It's like that you really are like sort of sweating with him. So, brace yourself for a messy funeral coming up soon. Oh, but, I love this bit. But first... We cut back for a minute to Luzin, Dunya's now ex-fiancé, who is really grimly regretting his hasty words. And he's so sad that he lost a woman who's so perfect for his ideal wife-surf situation. Luzin starts scheming. Now, he has a roommate... Lebeziatnikov. And they chat for a little bit about that horrible Raskolnikov and how he gave all that money to that scandalous family for the funeral. That skank. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sonia, who's their neighbor... She passes by, and she invites Luzin to the funeral. And he's like, oh, come in. So while Sonia is there, 
but he slips a wad of cash into her pocket without her noticing. And the roommate sees him give this money, and he's like, oh, isn't that nice of Lucin? Oh, what a great guy, giving charity <laughs> to this poor girl. So she doesn't notice or feel shame. So, the, the game is afoot. Uh, so, now for the memorial meal itself. Many people refuse to attend, and those that do are like real, you know, dross. Three helpless poles. There's a drunken retired colonel. There's a miserable runt of a clerk, mute, covered with blackheads in a greasy frock coat. Nice. Classic, classic clerk. <laughs> I think that's probably a 10 out of 10 for clerk. So they all drink and eat their fill while Katerine is clearly in the midst of a nervous breakdown and it's all quite sordid, isn't it? Yet Raskolnikov turns up and is gratefully received by Sonia and Katerina. Well, yeah, they're like, oh god, the, uh, thank god somebody who's under 40 and good looking. Please help this sad party. It's like the quarterback just turned up at, you know, a, a party that's dying. Captain of the football team, yeah. At long last, Illusion arrives. I'm here to announce that a hundred ruble banknote has been stolen from me. Sonia was in my flat earlier, so she's the prime suspect. Sonia is mortified and protests her innocence. Classy guy interrupting a funeral for this shit. Katerina offers to search Sonia and turning out her pockets. Oh, what do we have here? It's a hundred ruble note. <gasps> so Sonia's in trouble. How vile! Someone shouts. It's Lebez Yatnikov. He saw the whole thing. He says, Lusion, you put the hundred rubles in her pocket when she left. Everybody turns on Lusion and Raskolnikov pipes up. Lusion did this to disgrace me by proxy because it's about me, Raskolnikov. <laughs> <laughs> by showing my family that I hang around thieves and therefore getting back in with my sister. That is the stupidest plan I have ever heard and I read Pamela. <laughs> and it almost works too if the roommate hadn't piped up. If only it wasn't for you pesky roommate. <laughs> Sonia descends into hysteria before running home. Poor old Sonia. Raskolnikov follows her and thinks, this is a good time for me to confess to the murder. <laughs> yes, it's crazy. <laughs> yes, by all means, sir, make your moral laxity her problem. So Raskolnikov chases her down and he confesses in this weird muddled way, but it's, it's enough for Sonia to get the gist. And she's horrified, not only by the murderers themselves, but by how much he's torturing himself. No. Oh, and she urges him to go to the police. Then, in case y'all want some more melodrama, Sonia's stepmother and children have been kicked out of their apartment by their landlady at their husband stroke father's funeral, and they have nowhere to go. So this has sent her stepmother, who is already frail and dying, over the edge into insanity. Hey. And she takes the children out into the street and makes them perform for money. And the kids are there just like, what the fuck is happening? This is trauma in real time. Mm -hmm. Not enough therapists in the world. And poor Sonia, who's just like handling a murder confession, has to wrangle everyone back into her apartment, where then the stepmother promptly dies of, I don't know, something. And then, do you want another grim bit? Yes, because please. this is a rushing nesting doll of tragedy, and every set piece opens into another nugget of despair. Svidrigailov, Dunya's old creep of an employer, turns up and says he is going to basically take back the money his wife left Dunya in her will, the 3,000 rubles, the sort of like, I'm sorry, rubles, and instead he's going to give that money to Sonya's family for some reason. I'm like, what are they to him to help cover all these funeral arrangements and put the children in good orphanages? The best orphanages! <laughs> Just, what? why is he even doing this, though? I, it, isn't this illegal? Sonya knows about Raskolnikov's crime. Zvidrigailov knows about Raskolnikov's crime. He's stuck between, you know, the devil and the deep blue sea, or whatever <laughs> you, I don't know. And this results in another of his classic nervous breakdowns. Well, I mean, for those keeping track at home... Razumikin tries to intervene. Why? If I were Razumikin at this point, and this was the state of my only friendship, I'd be like, Raskolnikov who? I don't know that broke bitch. It's the spirit. The spirit of goodness. I, uh, clearly, I don't possess that to just yeah. let somebody walk all yeah, over yeah, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Razumikin tries to intervene. He wants Raskolnikov to come clean. He confirms that Mikolka has confessed to the murder and that Paul Free doesn't suspect him anymore. Razumikin also informs Raskolnikov that Donya has received a mysterious letter. Hmm. They part ways and soon after, Paul Free turns up. <laughs> Paul Free's here. He's by Raskolnikov's bedside now. Everyone's always behind. By, by... There's what? Lock the door. So, Porfiry the detective, 
Well, he's like, I guess he's probably like, well, you just burst in in my flat that one time. Maybe I'll repay the favor. And he's like, listen, I know we have somebody who has confessed to the murder. I still think you kind of did it. And frankly, we're probably going to arrest you soon. But goddamn, if I don't respect you. Mm -hmm. It's like that scene uh, with Vince Vaughn at the end of Anchorman. So he recommends that Raskolnikov give himself up just to make the whole process easier. And Raskolnikov's like, nah, I'm good. I think I'd rather just keep going down this anxiety spiral. I will not be making a confession. And that's a very Russian move. Raskolnikov goes to see Svidrigailov because he wants to ask if he has, has told him Porphyry what he knows. En route, he sees Svidrigailov watching him from the window of a bar drinking champagne. That's such a good bit. That's it? a yeah. great bit of imagery, just like toasting somebody from afar. That's such a creep move. Yeah, is, there's a lot of paranoia in this. The that, poetics of paranoia, isn't it? That is my greatest dream, to be having a really great day and seeing somebody you fucking hate having a miserable time, and you have champagne in your hand and you just toast them from afar. That is the bitchiest move. I've always wanted to do it. That and throwing a drink in somebody's face. Always wanted to do it. Never had the balls. Okay. I think I'd prefer to have a really bad day and walk across the square and see somebody that I really hate having the champagne. Well, we can make this happen. So Raskolnikov goes and joins him in this bar. Svidrigailov is like, I haven't told Porfiry nothing. Raskolnikov's like, well, even if you can do me and if you've got this over me, I don't care. If you come near my sister, I will kill you before you can put me in jail. Svidrigailov is unfazed. He's like, I'm a hedonist and all I'm worried about is being bored. A decent man is obliged to be bored, but if I were bored, I would shoot myself. <laughs> then he tells Raskolnikov about his life with Marfa Petrovna, his deceased wife. She was old and constantly kept some sort of clove in her mouth. Don't know what that's about. I think that's like a breath mint thing. Would uh, yeah, it seems so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he didn't fancy her, so they agreed on a kind of open relationship, didn't they, where he could shag around as long as he remained kind of long-term loyal to her and told her everything about what he was up to. The problem with Donya in particular, was therefore not that he was, you know, going for her, but that, this is what Svidrigailov says anyway, the issue was that both of the Svidrigailovs had fallen in love with her. Hey, hey, queer reading! Yes. Ooh, that's a, that's a throuple I am not into. No, mm -mm. what? Cloves, sort of amoral weirdos, and Donya. Anyway, that's all over with now. Svidrigailov He's going to marry some 15-year-old, and he's pretty excited about it. Raskolnikov is like, I can't work you out. You're an abusive, bullying, paedophile, and possible murderer, but you also paid for Katerina Ivanova's funeral and sent her kids to one of the nice orphanages that they have these days. And Svidrigailov's just like, well, I do what I please. So it turns out it's Svidrigailov who's been writing these weird letters to Dunya, trying to get all up in her business again. And he's told her that she better meet with him or he'll reveal her brother's horrible secret. And Dunya's like, what? My brother has a secret? What are you talking about? Svidrigailov convinces Dunya to come up to his rooms and he reveals there what he overheard Raskolnikov confess to Sonia. And so he's like, so your brother committed these murders. You horny yet, baby? Mm -hmm. And he tries to basically blackmail her into sex for him keeping quiet. He gets all grabby, so Dunya pulls out a gun and shoots at him, narrowly missing. And he's like, oh, baby, you're so passionate. Go on, reload, try again. Shoot me, shoot me. And it gets really kinky and weird. It's basic Russian courtship. I, I was going to say, I reiterate, <laughs> very Russian yeah. move. And Dunya eventually realizes she can't bring herself to kill somebody. She throws the gun aside. Svidrigailov goes out partying in various cesspools. There's a really great bit of Clark's. I'm not going to talk oh about it. God. See, I can hold back, but it's a really funny bit. He visits... Just read the book and you'll, you'll enjoy it too. He, he visits Sonia and gives her the 3,000 rubles, and he's like, I know everything about Raskolnikov, but I won't babble. Anyway, you'll need it if you're to accompany Raskolnikov to Siberia. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he kind of knows that they're pretty sweet on each other, and also that Raskolnikov is inevitably going to go to Siberia. Just that's put, that's planting a real seed in her head. I, I think she'd been like, um, I, I have not had made any mentions of Siberia, sir. <laughs> then he goes to see his child bride. Uh, it's quite a sordid scene, isn't it? He's like, I'm going to have to leave town for a while. Uh, and he gives her 15,000 rubles. The next morning, he goes to a public place, and he blows his brains out. Oh! 
Okay, curveball. We did have Dostoevsky's gun early on, didn't he, when he said, if I'm ever bored, I'll shoot myself. That's true, and also, why not? Because Russia, that's for why. Uh, so Raskolnikov decides to confess to the murders. He's like, I can't do this anymore. And on the way to the police station, he stops by Sonia's place, and she gives him a crucifix, and is like, you're doing the right thing. Not the classic Russian literature motif. Swap the crosses, baby. Yeah. <laughs> So at this station, he learns of Svidrigailov's suicide. So he can literally walk away from this and start over. There is now nobody who knows apart from Sonia, and she's not going to tell. And Paul Free, who has an inkling but has no proof. Yeah, exactly. And so he changes his mind about confessing. You know, do it, Raskolnikov, because you do not want to do life in prison. That's like five whole years. So he turns around, and he walks out of the police station. But then... Outside, he sees Sonia, who's looking at him. She's giving him the stink eye, and she's like, Hey, mister, you better turn around and go back in there. And so he stops, he kisses the ground, a bunch of people laugh at him for doing so, and then he goes right back into the station and confesses. Picture the scene. Siberia. One of them prisons that they have there. A year and a half has passed since the day of Raskolnikov's crime. The trial, we get a little bit of back backstory on that, don't we? The trial went fairly smoothly. Uh, because Raskolnikov had never even looked into the loot, but left it under the rock, and also he gets a bunch of character witnesses from Zosimov and his friends, who were all like, this guy was mental. So overall, you know, we're going to go relatively easy on you. Also, here's a bit that I thought was strange. His landlady comes and says he saved two children from a fire. This is in the prequel. Yeah, that scene has been cut for time, apparently. In this 600-page book, we're not a goddamn thing ever gets cut for any reason. The we're exciting... interested in psychology <laughs> and dialogue. We're not interested in rescuing children from fires. This is not Lassie. Oh. He gets this quite mitigated sentence. Eight years of penal servitude. I think it was supposed to be like 20 or something, wasn't it? Dunya and Razumikin Raz kept all of this info from Raskolnikov's mother, but she kind of like, a mother, a mother knows. <laughs> so she, she had a nervous breakdown and eventually died. Oh. Razumikin and Dunya get married. Ew, she can do a lot better. I like Razumikin. Yeah, yeah, I like him too. It doesn't mean that you should marry the guy. Dunya is like a St. Petersburg 8, and he's a St. Petersburg 3. No. Sonia follows Raskolnikov to Siberia. Are they even dating? What is this? Raskolnikov, he's kind of going through some stuff, and he's like, Sonia, go away. I'm garbage. I still kind of think I was right to do the murder, and the only thing I'm guilty of is being weak and cracking like a Fabergé egg. But Sonia just won't give up, and eventually he succumbs to her moral influence, and in prison, he has a full redemption. The end. I'm bloody knackered. <laughs> Right, so would you like some casting, friend? Yes, please. I was I, I really struggled with this one because there's so much internal emotion and, and melodrama here that needs to be condensed without losing any of its nuance or impact. So I want a pre-code film, maybe a silent film, where a lot of the internal strife can be read in a single shot or expression. And I was thinking about who would star in this film, and I've picked, I think, the perfect guy, James Cagney. Because he looks... You dirty rat. But he looks crazy. I genuinely believe that he has it in him to murder someone. But at the same time, there's something so charismatic about him. You do kind of root for him in all of his films. Um, I really thought you were going to go on the Martin Scorsese route. King of comedy and Taxi Driver are practically just crime and punishment anyway. It kind of, I thought about that, but it kind of seemed a little obvious. Okay, sorry. It's because I went, I've gone through a Jimmy Cagney phase. Okay. Um, and yeah, we've all been there listening. <laughs> Right, are you ready for some bad Goodreads reviews? So, the one thing that really annoyed me is I saw approximately 900 people saying the crime was writing it and reading it was our punishment and I want to beg all of you, please stop. The joke has been done. It's a good joke. It's not a good joke, it's a rubbish joke. I'm giving up now. Perhaps in another life I'll come back to it and see how the marmalade spreads, so to speak. But enough now. Two stars. <laughs> okay, this one. All these Russian names are super confusing. Some characters have three different names in the book, and there are even characters with the same last name. Two stars. Yes, most books have this, when you have characters who are related. I just... ma'am. <laughs> right, now some analysis. Polyphony. So yeah, Dostoevsky enters into the heads of his characters and allows them to converse on their own terms. There's no kind of real narratorial judgment, is there? 
Then again, also a lot of the characters, they're these kind of extreme intellectual social types like Savage Guy, Love and Illusion. So we're kind of like, it's not like a nuanced approach, is it? But it is like a balanced one. Right? I kind of think that about the funny name thing. People not complaining about na getting confused by the names. I know that Russians did that anyway, but I feel like if, if you have a culture in which there are supposedly all these confusing names, that really does add to that sort of feverish, you know, yeah. variability or whatever. Yeah, and also because we have this sort of wealth of opinion and perspective there, we can see that crime is to some extent, as, as they talk about, it is dependent on the society yeah, and the it's time. it's a social thing, yeah. And so there is no one actual universal crime. In terms of, if we're thinking about issues of the law and boundaries of the law. I was thinking about boundaries of genre here mm. um, in terms of this being detective fiction. And I think this is a, a really fun early example of anti-detective fiction. So anti-detective fiction is actually a, a critical term in sort of postmodern literature where the crime is never solved really. It's the sort of, you know, things like the crying of Lot 49 and things like that where you, know, you never find out really who did it. But I think that this is... This is absolutely a police procedural. We're just seeing it from the other side mm. of the procedure, isn't it? It's a, it's a who done it, but from the side of the person who did it. Yeah, and now he needs to work out why he did it. Yeah, yeah. There aren't versions of this where Porphyry is the main character. People have written that. Are there really? Like, done it? Yeah. So yeah, so they've re-established the thing that <laughs> Dostoevsky was kind of working against. But in a postmodern way, I suppose, to kind of rewrite a novel is a postmodern device, I, isn't it? I guess, but to rewrite it in a way that makes it more Very conventional, conventional yeah. that's that seems to have kind of missed the mark. I I don't know. I mean, maybe it depends how they do it. Porphyry's a great character, though, so I suppose it'd be cool to be in his head a bit more. I guess, but that seems like a step backward. The big thing, the big question is that everyone asks is, did Dost Dostoevsky cheat? by having Raskolnikov also kill Lizaveta, because uh, she's like a total innocent, isn't she? Of course, didn't quote-unquote deserve to be killed, unlike maybe Aljona. But I think, okay, so this is actually connecting to my later point, which is, why is it that people keep breaking into his room all the time? Why is his room such a porous space where people just come and go? And the same thing happens in the murder scene, where somebody comes in unexpectedly and it changes the whole course of things. And I was really trying to figure out why there's sort of this clown car situation mm -hmm. throughout the whole book. And it's I, I sort of wondered if it was the porousness of society in that... For all that he wants to be sort of an individual, he thinks of self of this extraordinary yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Your actions still have repercussions. You still live in a society as much as you wish you don't. No, it's a relational narrative, definitely. And that, yeah, it can't... It, it's, so you can't, yeah. like, for all that he's this individual and he goes unnoticed and he, you know, can do these things outside the pale of society. Well, okay, but here's the collateral damage. And that's the parallel with Lucian, isn't it? That he, Raskolnikov trashes Lucian's worldview that everybody's just like a self-loving individual atom. But Raskolnikov tries to live that and yes. goes completely crazy. Yes in so doing. But yeah, you're definitely right that it's about, you, you're living in a society, you can't <laughs> avoid the fact that people are going to turn up. Um, yeah, I like that. That's cool. But the, the ripple effects of this, where it's only after the murder, he's like, oh god, but what's going to happen if I get caught and my poor mother and sister? Yeah. And it's like, well, you couldn't have thought of that before. Yeah, uh, spatiality is weird in general in the novel, though, isn't it? Like, you're right that there is a kind of, you could read a kind of utopian element into it, maybe, that we're all interconnected, but it's also, it's very nightmarish, and there is a sense that you're kind of, co it's very invasive that people are just turning up and constantly kind of bothering people and spying well, on people. But that's that's why I don't think it's utopian at all. I think it's very... But, but you could see it utopian. You could, yeah. Yeah. You could do, but I read this as very value neutral of, well, what are you going to do? Your actions have consequences. You live in a society. Sometimes that's crap when you just want to be left alone to ha have your fever in peace. Sometimes it's really awful, like when somebody stumbles in, you know, <laughs> when you're in the middle of murdering somebody and then you have to kill them too. And, you know, sometimes it's it's beneficial when you get help. So anyway, yeah, so you think it was okay for him to kill Aljana, but not Lizaveta? No, I don't. Why, why, why are you putting those words? That's, no, but I'm just, I'm just wondering that because that's that is a, a question, isn't it? Why, if he had just killed Aljana, would we have not felt the same way? <sighs> yes, I think we would because, I mean, I think we're inclined to be led in that way because that murder scene is so horrible, mm. and it's obviously compounded with Lizaveta, but that is an awful scene and he clearly is stressing about it even before so yeah. i don't imagine lizaveta was obviously might have made it worse but he would have done this exact same trajectory so in terms of this being you know one of the most boring books ever written apparently i i struggled 
there were parts of it that I really, I thought like this could be a lot shorter, but at the same time, I mean, if it's trying to replicate this long grinding dread of what you've done, mm. then I guess mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah, that's the point of it. It's, the, it's meant to be punishment, it's meant to be grueling. Yeah, give yourself time to read this maybe. If you have to read it quick, you're not gonna have a good time of it. Yeah. But if this is something that you're happy to pick away at for a year, you know, a chapter or something before you go to bed, you might really get something out of this. Great, that was good, I enjoyed that, yes. Well, you've already had the advice at the top of the episode, so I'll just head right into our clue to the next episode. Someone famously dresses in yellow stockings. Ooh. Ooh. What could that be? I've got one too. Do you? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> it might be Christmas Day in Russia, but over here in Old Blighty, it's something else. Okay, that's cute. That's cute. Thank you. I get it. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So please write into our email or tweet us at smfms underscore podcast. Please subscribe wherever you listen. It just helps us out. It helps people find us. What? Write some bloody reviews as well. Come on. <laughs> I'm sick of this. <laughs> oh, Daniel's getting terribly cross. Please write reviews or I don't know what's going to happen. Oh. All right, guys. We will see you in two weeks. Bye. Daz Vidania. Thanks for listening to Save Me From My Shelf. Our music is The Overture to Don Giovanni by Mozart, and cover art is by Catherine Wu. Our thanks to Aston University's Centre for Critical Inquiry and to Society and Culture for funding the startup of this podcast. Contact us at savemefrommyshelf at gmail.com or at smfms underscore podcast on Twitter. And do not... I'm going to remind you, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Do not forget. Thank you.